as we sang, this is the day, and we've been waiting for it for quite a while, actually, and praying about it, and we thank God that it is here. We uh, welcome you here this evening. Uh, we pray that your hearts are open, your minds are ready to be filled uh, with looking at the last days. We have been uh, thankful for uh, Mac Dumcom, who's willing again to come and visit us, only this time we've got to keep him for a couple days in a row, which is really nice. And so uh, we look forward to tonight and tomorrow and Sunday morning as well. Uh, we will have uh, two sessions this evening, and we'll have a break as uh, soon as Mac, Mac finishes the first session so that he can catch his breath. And uh, we'll have uh, some refreshments as well at that time. And then in about 10 or 15 minutes after that, we'll begin the second session uh, this evening. The first one, Daniel's preview, and the second, the first prophecy conference. And uh, so before I call Mac up, I'm going to just ask us to pray. Let's offer this to the Lord. Lord God, we thank you that we can count on you in all things. We thank you that this is the day that you have made, and we can rejoice in it. We pray that you will open our hearts and our minds to hear from you today and to, so that we can understand uh, what is said. We thank you for the guidance and moving of your Holy Spirit among us so that we can understand. We pray that you will uh, anoint Mac, that you will anoint him with the words that uh, you have given to him, that you have shown him in your word so that uh, we can be taught. We thank you that he is an excellent teacher that you have raised up at th for this time, for us at this time here in Killarney particularly. So we give you praise and thanks, and we give it all, you all the glory in Jesus' name. Well, Mac, we ask you to come and uh, share with us what God has laid on your heart from his word. Well, good evening, everybody. Oh, come on. On a Friday night, you can do better than that. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Uh, so good to be back in Killarney, even though it is a three-hour drive. And uh, I should have known better than to take the 75. There's always construction on 75. It slowed me down by 20 minutes, and I don't like to be slowed down. But I still made it. I still made it. I told uh, Ken that I was going to be here by 4 o'clock, and I rolled in at 3.59. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we did okay. But uh, anyway, it's so good to be here. And I have really been looking forward to this, uh, to this event and uh, with great anticipation. Now, let me ask a couple of questions here. How many of you have not heard me speak before? Where have you been? <laughs> um, so you will know that I do have a bit of an accent. Please do not hold that against me. I was born and raised in southwest Kansas, and after 40-some years in Canada, I haven't been able to lose it. And uh, it's really quite interesting because since the last time I was here, I've actually begun working full-time at Fox Nursery just outside of New Bothwell, so I'm slinging plants now. And, uh, and there's no marijuana, Al, so don't even go there. But, but uh, that also explains the rather swarthy complexion. And if you see me itching, it's because I picked up a thorn or two the other day. Something happened. But uh, every once in a while, people all of a sudden stop and look at me, and they say, you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> and uh, no, I'm actually not. But uh, anyway, the only thing you need to know about me is I am, uh, I've been a Christian for almost 49 years. It'll be 49 years on July the 24th. And I can tell you that Jesus is more wonderful today than he was 49 years ago, and he was wonderful then. And I'm the husband of one, I'm the father of two, I am the papa of three and three quarters. <laughs> Number four is coming in September. The only problem is they're all in Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah, the collective moan. And uh, so we do lots of FaceTime and uh, we travel lots, but uh, it's wonderful. So enough about me. Um, a couple of preliminary things that I want to, to share with you before we actually dive into the material. 
um, just things you need to know. First of all, we are not going to make it through the entire book of the Revelation. If that's what you thought coming here, you will be disappointed uh, because that would take months to do that. Now, Brother John back there, he could probably do it in a couple of days, but I could never do it in a couple of days. And so uh, if you came expecting to go through the entire book of Revelation, that won't happen. We will spend a significant chunk of time there, but we need to lay a foundation before we get there so that that actually begins to make sense to you. And so uh, you can know that. The other thing that you need to know is that you are not going to get all your questions answered. If you came thinking that I had the answer to all your questions on the end times, I would suggest you think again because I don't even have all my questions answered. I'm glad for what I know, and I'm very happy uh, for, for what I know, and I'm willing to share what I know. But uh, you will walk away, and you will still have some questions, and that's okay. What I would encourage you to do is let your questions inspire you to dig deeper to find the answers. We will give you lots to work with. That much I can guarantee you. But what you do with that is up to you. That will provide you a solid foundation for you to go and continue growing and learning on this very vital topic. Now, we will not be taking time for questions after each session, because that would just take too long. Plus, the first three sessions, the two tonight and the first one tomorrow, really lay a foundation for everything else. So I won't be taking questions until after tomorrow morning's first session, okay? So just so you know that. Um, and, and I do that because a lot of your questions, if you will continue to listen, a lot of your questions will probably be answered as we go along. So if you got a question, jot it down and uh, just see if it doesn't get answered. And if it doesn't, then we'll, uh, we'll figure it out. And if I can't answer it, Ken will. But uh, <laughs> so you're on the hook, brother. I'm sorry. But, um, you know, I don't know it all. And I'm not afraid to say I don't know. And that will inspire me to go and to, to dig deeper as well. And I only have a couple of rules when it comes to questions. I will only take questions based on what I have shared, okay? We're not going to go off into left field somewhere and, and talk about something that we, we haven't talked about because that wouldn't be fair, right? And please don't ask me about somebody else's teaching. I, I don't know why they teach what they do. And if you want to know why they teach it the way they teach it, you need to go and ask them. So if you stand up and say, um, why does brother so-and-so teach it this way? My standard answer is I have no clue because I don't know him and I don't know why he does what he does. So you need to go and talk to them. And so just so you know that. Uh, the other thing and probably the most important thing that I will say here is you're under no obligation to accept anything that I say. You're not. I am not the final authority on anything. I share what I know, but I don't know it all. And I am not perfect, you know. That's a shock to most, I'm sure, but um, I'm not, you know. You're, you're under no obligation, but please, please, whatever you do, do not fall into the mistake of comparing one teaching with another teaching. Take all the teaching and compare it to the Word of God. That's the only thing that matters. Take what I say, compare it to the Word of God. If you come up with a, new, a, a different conclusion, great. You can be wrong. That's okay. <laughs> I was wondering who would catch that. No, I'm, I'm totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. But good for you. That means you're thinking for yourself. Most people don't. They, they prefer to be spoon-fed, right? They don't want to do the hard work of going and digging into the Word of God for themselves. What I can tell you is that what I am sharing with you has been hard won on the field of personal study. Yes, in the early days, I did use some, some works by some various authors, but I can guarantee you this, that I had their stuff in one hand, but I had my Bible in the other, and the Bible was always the final authority. And so that's what I'm sharing with you. 
So just so you know where we're going, uh, as has already been said, and you can see with your, aren't those bulletins great? I, I saw that in the, when we were praying together. I think that's the neatest thing. You've got notepads, so now you have no excuse for not taking notes because you've been handed a bulletin and a pen. So there you go. So tonight we'll be talking about Daniel's preview and the first prophecy conference. Tomorrow we're going to be making the connection. We're going to find out why heaven was silent. Tomorrow afternoon we are going to be talking about the Antichrist uh, because of all the questions and the craziness that is uh, out there about that. And then Sunday morning we will finish with the grand finale. I mean, <laughs> what better way to finish, right? So if you've got your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Daniel chapter 9. Now, tonight only, I will be teaching this entire message from the New Living Translation, and the reason I do that is because the New Living Translation just is really good where Old Testament things are concerned. It brings a lot of clarity. Most of the time, and the rest of the sessions, I'll be teaching from the New English Translation, but I will all usually reference the New Living wherever an Old Testament reference is concerned. So here in Daniel chapter 9, we're going to look, first of all, at verses 1 to 3, and then we're going to skip down to verses 20 to 23. So Daniel 9, 1 says, In the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede, the son of Ahasuerus, who became king of the Babylonians, during the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from the reading of the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. So I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled, sprinkled myself with ashes. Now let's go down to verse 20. It says, I went on praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, pleading with the Lord my God for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. As I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. He explained to me, Daniel... I have come here to give you insight and understanding. The moment you began praying, a command was given, and now I am here to tell you what, what it was, for you are very precious to God. Listen carefully so that you can understand the meaning of your vision. Now, out of all the prophecies that point to the last days, the revelation given to Daniel in this encounter is foundational to the understanding of all of them. And I cannot emphasize that enough. Out of all the prophecies that point to the last days, this revelation given to Daniel in this encounter is foundation to understanding all the rest. If we don't get this, the rest doesn't fall into place very well. Okay, So that's what we need to know. Jesus spoke about this revelation in his teaching. Um, it certainly provided a framework for the thinking of the Apostle Paul. Uh, it can also be seen all through John's revelation. And so if we hope to understand those prophecies, it's vitally important that we understand this one. So put on your thinking caps and track with me as we unpack Daniel's preview. Now, let's give some, some background context to this so we know what's going on here. All right, so we know that the Lord repeatedly threatened exile for continued sin and rebellion. He constantly was after Israel. If you continue in your sins, I'm going to kick you out of your land. Uh, one instance of that was Deuteronomy 28, verses 36 and 37, where the Lord says, uh, The Lord will exile you and your king to a nation unknown to you and your ancestors. There in exile, you will worship gods of wood and stone, You'll become an object of horror, ridicule, and mockery uh, among all the nations to which the Lord sends you. So that was a continual threat that the Lord made because his people continually turned to idolatry and forsook the Lord. And they would have times when they would come back to the Lord and then that generation would die off and the next generation would go back into idolatry. And finally, it came to the point where the Lord said, enough is enough. We're not doing this anymore. And the exile took place. Now, the beginning of the end started in 605 B.C. All right. That's when the beginning of the end started, 605 B.C. 
Babylon made Israel a vassal state and took its king, some of the items of the temple, as well as some of the people back to Babylon. You can read about that in 2 Chronicles 36, verses 5 to 7. Okay? Daniel would have been included in that first stage of exile. You can read about that in Daniel 1, verses 1 to 4. And Daniel would have been a teenager at that time. Okay, so he was taken away from his homeland. He was brought to Babylon, probably made into a eunuch, trained in the ways of the Babylonians and raised up to serve in the courts of the king of Babylon. All right. So that was all around 605 B.C. Daniel 9 takes place in 539 B.C. Now, I have to remember that when we count B.C. time, it always counts backward because it counts down to zero, and then the A.D. time starts after that and counts forward. All right, so that's why the exile starts in 605, and now this is starting in uh, 539, and it sounds backward. But Daniel now is in his 80s, having lived almost his whole life in Babylon, in the upper echelons of power. It's absolutely amazing. Here's this exile, this kid from Israel who has risen by the grace of God into these places of influence and what a place of influence he had. And during this time, he is studying uh, the scroll of Jeremiah. Uh, Somehow he got his hands on a copy and he learns that the exile is supposed to last for 70 years. Okay? Okay. We read that in Jeremiah 25, 11 and 29, 10. So let's look at that. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, This entire land will become a desolate wasteland. Israel and her neighboring lands will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. And 29, 10 says, This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years. But then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised And I will bring you home again. And so now Daniel begins to seek the Lord regarding these things. And he prays an incredible uh, prayer of repentance that is recorded in verses or in chapter 9, verses 3 to 19. All right. Those are the verses we skipped over. But you want to read that at some point because it's just an incredible prayer of repentance on behalf of his people. But then this angel Gabriel was sent to him to give him understanding of a previous vision. That's what we just read in verses 20 to 23. Now, the vision that he is referring to is recorded in Daniel chapter 8. Okay, that's the vision that Daniel had had, and that is the vision that Gabriel has come to explain to him. That vision was given somewhere around 551 B.C., And Daniel did not understand it. He saw it, but he didn't understand it. He didn't know what it meant. And so now Gabriel has come to Daniel, who is now in his 80s, towards the end of his life. He has come to explain this vision. And the explanation begins in Daniel 9, verses 24 and 25. Gabriel tells him, he says, a period of 70 sets of seven. Please note that. Y'all underline that in your Bibles. A period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the holy place. Now listen and understand. Seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses despite perilous times. How many of you are confused already? Seven sets of seven what? Right? Okay. So, here's some things to know. Okay, preliminary things. First of all, these things are determined for Daniel's people, the Jews. All right? So all of this relates to the nation of the Jews. And what, will, what is to be accomplished shows that it cannot refer to just a number of days. 
right? I mean, <laughs> the things to be accomplished, to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, or in other words, to show that it's been completed, and to anoint the most holy place, okay? So all of that is supposed to happen within the scope of the time that was set. Now here's where you need to put on your thinking caps because we're going to have to think like a Hebrew, okay? You ready? Put on your, put on your yarmulkes and get ready to, to think like a Hebrew here. We tend to think in units of 10, especially if you use the metric system. Everything is in a unit of 10. And that is the most natural unit for you and I to think of. We think of tens. The Hebrews, however, thought in terms of seven. That is called a heptad, in case you didn't know that. <laughs> they thought in terms of seven due to the fact that every seventh year was a Sabbath year. So it was very natural for them to count time by sevens. Okay? Okay. Every seventh year was a Sabbath year, and seven sevens brought them to the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee was a time of restoration, a time of jubilation, a time of the canceling debts, a time when people were able to go back to their properties and uh, get out of the slave market and all kinds of different things. It was a wonderful time of reset where everybody got their, their bearings back and were able to move forward from that period. Okay, debts were canceled. It was a great time. And that's talked about in the, uh, the books of the law. So it would have been natural for Daniel, with that being the case, because Hebrews thought in terms of seven, seven years being a Sabbath year, seven sevens being a jubilee, it would have been natural for Daniel to think of 70 sevens as equaling 490 years, okay? That's what it ends up being. He's talking about 490 years. Now, here's a freebie. I won't charge you for this one. Every seven years, the land was to have a Sabbath. You can read about that in Leviticus chapter 25, verses 1 to 7. That means the land was to get a break. It was to rest and it was to lie fallow every seven years. The Israelites had failed to give the land its Sabbath 70 times. 70 times they had failed in this, a, a decree from God, because God is the greatest economist that we know. He's also the greatest agrarian. He knows agriculture. And so he was trying to help them along here with their agricultural society. And so 70 times they failed to give the land its Sabbath. And so this means there had been 490 years of disobedience. Isn't that interesting? And so their 70-year exile corresponded to all of that. You can read about that in 2 Chronicles 36, verse 21. Like I said, that's a freebie. No charge for that. So now here's the question. 490 years has been determined for the nation of Israel. When did the clock start? I'm so glad you asked because he tells us right here in verse 25. He says, now listen and understand. Seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses despite perilous times. So when did the clock start on this 490 period? From the time the command was given to rebuild Jerusalem. Now we have to remember that Jerusalem had literally been raised to the ground. When the Babylonians came in and finally took over uh, with Daniel, they only took part of the people away as uh, King Zechariah, <laughs> words fail me here, as the, king, as the final king in Israel continued his rebellion. Finally, Nebuchadnezzar showed up with his army, took everybody away except a few poor people, and literally burned the city to the ground. 
it was completely raised. Temple, everything, okay? So it lay, it, it lay in utter devastation and was a shame and a, a rebuke to the people of God. So now the clock is going to start whenever that command is given to rebuild the city. And although there were several decrees that were given, there is only one that actually matches these particular details. And that happened when King Artaxerxes allows Nehemiah to go back and restore the city. That is seen in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. Some people had come from Jerusalem, and Nehemiah had asked, how are the people in Jerusalem doing? And the report was not good. And so Nehemiah then, in chapter 1, begins this, this heart-wrenching prayer of repentance for the city of Jerusalem and for his people. And then in chapter 2, because he was the cupbearer of the king, and I find it so fascinating that all these Jews are placed in positions with royalty in Babylon. I mean, who but God could do that, right? So here's this guy, Nehemiah, who's literally the cupbearer of the king. That means it was his job to take the wine for the king, to taste it, to make sure it wasn't poisoned, and then to put it in the hands of the king. Very important role. And so now he's standing in the presence of the king and his face is sad and Artaxerxes looks at him and says, what's the matter with you, right? And so he tells him and he, he starts in his heart and Nehemiah is praying, oh God, oh God, oh God, help, oh God, oh God. And uh, there's this incredible conversation that takes place and Nehemiah says, how can I be happy when my city lies in devastation? And so Artaxerxes gives him the command to go back and to restore the temple or to restore the city. That takes place in 444 B.C. Very important. That command was given in 444 B.C. Now, now we have a specific time frame and its events. Gabriel says to Daniel, there are seven sets of seven, which equals 49 years. I don't know why I was looking at this this afternoon. I thought, why couldn't you have just said 62 sevens? But he didn't. He said, um, where am I at here? Verse 25. He says, seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven. Okay. Seven sets of seven equals 49 years. 62 sets of seven equals 434 years. 49 plus 434 equals 483 years. Aren't you glad to come to church to do math? Right? But you know what? It's all about the numbers. Now watch this. Where do we end up with this? He says there will be seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. So the command to rebuild was given roughly on Nisan 1, or March 5th, 444 B.C. Adding 483 Hebrew years. A Hebrew year was not 365 days. A Hebrew year was 360 days. Because they went by the lunar calendar, right? Right? So a Hebrew year was 360 days, adding 483 Hebrew years or 300, of 360 days takes us to the month of Nisan, which is March or April in A.D. 33. What happened on that day corresponds to Christ's triumphant entry when he was proclaimed Messiah by the people. Wow, look at that. Don't tell me God doesn't know what's about to happen. From 444 B.C., 483 years, Christ rides into Jerusalem, and they're all proclaiming, Hail, King of Israel. Hail, King of the Jews. Amazing. And, of course, during that whole time, that whole 483 years, Jerusalem was indeed rebuilt, although during much conflict, even Nehemiah, when he went back and started to rebuild the city, there was Sanballat and Tobiah who were constantly opposing him, trying to discourage him from rebuilding the city. 
and he just forged ahead and kept going, right? Okay, so that now we've ended up with 69 sets of seven, 483 years. We're missing seven years. What happened to that, right? Well, let's see if we can find out. Daniel 9, verses 26 and 27. After this period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing, and a ruler will rise uh, whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. The end will come with the flood and war, and its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven, but after half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings, and as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. So after 62 sevens, so 434 years after Jerusalem was rebuilt, um, there was a king who came, an anointed one, who appeared to have accomplished nothing. And to the naked eye, that's what it looked like. Because to most of the world, when Jesus died on the cross, that was the end of everything. They didn't know that was the beginning of everything, right? Because he was raised from the dead three days later. But to the average person, that looks like the end. So he actually accomplished nothing. Little did they know. And then... We talk about the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 when an army rises up and literally surrounds the, the city of Jerusalem, raises it to the ground once again, right? And so Israel has remained in conflict from that day forward, right? First of all, they were scattered throughout all the world. Eventually, they were regathered. And uh, now we have the state as we, we find it today. But notice that it does not say that this happens during the seventh or the 70th set of seven. All of that is afterwards. The 70th set of seven is still there. But then in verse 27, and here's the most confusing thing about Daniel. Daniel will switch topics almost mid-sentence in some places. So he will be talking about one ruler and then all of a sudden switch and begin talking about another ruler without really making a clear line of demarcation. So you really have to know your history a little bit and how things panned out in order to actually understand what he's saying. Because in verse 27, he says, the ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven. But after, this, but after half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. And as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes or desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. When you see the word treaty, think peace agreement. There is a ruler that is going to rise up and make a peace agreement with Israel for seven years years one set of seven okay but after half that time after three and a half years a change is going to take place he is going to reveal his true colors this is talking about the antichrist no other ruler fits the description of what is said here the Antichrist will put an end to worship because, as we will find out later, he will declare himself to be God. He will set up a sacrilegious object. He will set up a tribute to himself. And all of that will take place until the fate that has been decreed is poured out upon him. My question is, when was that fate decreed? In answer to that, we go back a couple of pages to Daniel chapter 7. 
Daniel chapter 7, verses 23 to 26. Then he said to me, The fourth beast is the fourth world power that will rule the earth. It will be different from all the others. It will devour the whole world, trampling and crushing everything in its path. Its ten horns are ten kings who will rule that empire. Then another king will arise, different from the other ten, who will subdue three of them. He will defy the Most High and oppress the holy people of the Most High. He will try to change their sacred festivals and laws, and they will be placed under his control for a time, times, and half a time. Notice that. But then the court will pass judgment, and all his power will be taken away and completely destroyed. There is the decree that this ruler is going to be rubbed out, completely wiped out. So the fate decreed upon him in Daniel chapter 9 is actually said here in Daniel 7. But now look at what we've got here. We've got 69 sevens, and then all of a sudden, way out in the future someplace, we've got a 70th seven. Why the gap? Why didn't God just do it all at once? Well, (laughs) the most plausible answer that I've been able to find is that God evidently stopped the clock after Israel's rejection of the Messiah. Brought that time to a halt. And the Old Testament prophets, and this is one thing we must know, the Old Testament prophets, by and large, did not see the mystery of the church. Now, you see that um, diagram on the, on the overhead. They could see Christ and his sufferings. I mean, Isaiah 53 is one of the most beautiful depictions of the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow it. Psalm 22 and, and others. They could see that, and they could see far ahead Uh, to the Antichrist and his defeat like we just read, and also see to the coming kingdom of God, but viewed between what we call the two mountain peaks of prophecy is the mystery of the church. They prophesied about a time when the Gentiles would come in, but they had no clue what that meant. But here it is, the Gentiles come in, that's the mystery of the church. That was by and large passed over. They didn't see all of that. But what we do know is at the appropriate time, God will restart the clock and will confirm Daniel's prophecy. So there you have it. Daniel's preview revealed a timeline of God's dealing with his people. 483 years of that timeline have come and gone And things unfolded exactly the way God said they would. How amazing is that? We are still waiting for the final set of seven years to take place. If the first 483 years came to pass as forecasted, we can be sure that the final seven will as well. And armed with this knowledge, we are also better equipped to understand the prophecies of the New Testament as they are presented. That is the end of session one. Let's take about uh, a 15-minute break and come back for session two.